Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Carla Diana. Carla is a designer, author, and educator who explores the impact of future technologies through tinkering. Carla has been granted the honor of creating the 4D design program at the Cranbrook Academy of Art, a two-year master's in creative technology. She also serves as head of design for Diligent Robotics and is the co-host of the RoboPsych podcast, a bi-weekly discussion around design and the psychological impact of human-robot interaction. Hey, Carla, how are you? Hey, I'm doing really well, and I'm super excited to be part of Cool Tools. Yeah, we're so excited to have you. We are very delighted to um, have you join us and um, to meet you and to hear about what you're excited by these days. Yeah, you are you are a user of all sorts of cool and interesting tools. You're a fabulous maker. Um, so let's find out what you're using. One of them is this uh, quad hands, workbench, helping hands, soldering third hand vice. Yes. Tell us what that is. Okay. So um, there is a thing called a third hand that I think you, I think you guys are um, at least as geeky as I am and surely more. Um, and the third hand, so the third hand is a thing that helps you when you're tinkering, tinkering with electronics to hold something so that you can work with both of your hands on that thing. So it mm-hmm. usually has an alligator clip and then there's this system of of metal bars that are held together with wing nuts and you can adjust them and the and they're the wing nuts are always getting loose and they're and they're they're always it's always this anxiety provoking experience. Um, but I love my quad hands. So the quad hands is a completely different type of third hand tool that has these four arms. And I'm looking at mine right now. It has four arms and each of them works like the bar that I just described with the alligator clip on the end mm-hmm. of it, except mm-hmm. with, with instead of the wing nuts, it's um, a flexible shaft with uh, a, a gooseneck. That's okay. what they call it. A like a gooseneck goose lamp, neck, kind of. Like a gooseneck lamp. And so there are four of them, and two of them are short, and two of them are longer. And they have these super strong rare earth magnets at the base of them. And then there's this big orange Ooh. metal base. So you can also shift the position of them. And, and you use the third hand to hold maybe a, a couple pieces of wire while you're soldering them, or you hold a component and the component gets held against the, the wire or a, a breadboard. Um, yeah. So the you can just kind of lift them off the base and then plop them back where you need them and then adjust the gooseneck. So it's at the exact position that you need and um yeah it's and another thing i love to do with them because it's got those super strong magnets is sometimes i just pull them off the base altogether and i have a table this ikea table with metal legs and i'll just plop one of them on the side and it's holding apart for me mm, and um cool i love this thing yeah so you don't necessarily need that attractive orangish yellow base right you have and and so my my main question is those little gooseneck uh arms is there like are they floppy or is there like kind of backlash or do they like stay rigid in position yeah they stay rigid in position there's a little bit of there i mean that that would be my one complaint sometimes it does if there's yeah there's a little bit of play and if something is a little actually not the the heavy thing doesn't usually come up but there is a little bit of play so there Mm -hmm. there, there's that but but it's much better than the uh i'm always experiencing the wing nuts coming loose and the things kind of flopping around so yeah it's better than that those original third hands that like the radio shack kind those are like terrible they're almost yeah there, and with a big magnifying glass on it. I, I, yeah. Yeah. This one yeah. just looks so much better. Yeah. It's a cool tool. But it does not have a magnifying lens uh, as part of, at least as part of the core kit. So I don't mm-hmm. know. Maybe. But you, maybe. Could add, you could add one pretty easily. You I could think. add yeah. one. Uh, yes. But uh, I, I prefer For actually sure. just wearing really high powered um, 
reading glasses or something if yeah. I'm doing soldering work anyway, because those magnifying glasses to me are just almost like a barrier. Yeah. 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 I've never, I've never really used it very much. I like your idea of the glasses though. I, I need help. Yeah. I'm at the age where I need, I need help. Yeah. I need more every year. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you, okay. That looks really cool. And uh, so we're looking at about uh, 50 bucks for it. And, well um, worth it. Yeah, well worth it if you're if you're doing any kind of soldering work. This looks like the thing to have. Mm -hmm. Very cool. And, oh, there's and I just should just mention there's a mini model with two hands. That's only oh. thirty dollars. Oh, yeah, I don't that's have that. Cool. I've I've ordered several. I've given these away as gifts as well. Oh, that looks that's a great it's, it's idea. It's a nice gift. There yeah. is actually another version that has four handles, but they're fixed. And they're really, it, they're on a kind of a cross rather than on a flat uh, square. Oh, yeah. Table. Oh, I've seen oh, that. You yeah. know, the fancy LED. Right. Yeah. Oh, and there's, so. another, there's another quad hands, well, same brand. It's a bigger workbench and it has six arms on it. Oh, yeah. now that's Almost an kind of deluxe. <laughs> yeah. That's deluxe. I have wow. not seen that one. I've seen the one that's the cross, which is actually mm -hmm. as a design object. Also a very cool looking thing on one's desk. If yeah, definitely that's cool. All right, so let's uh, let's take a look at your next one: the Nano Leaf interactive and programmable modular light panels. Yes. Ooh. Okay, yeah. So if you're doing work, you need you need some. Oh, okay. So these go on the. Oh, wow. Okay. So describe what they look like and and where they go and all that. Yeah. So these are tiles that go on the wall. I first discovered them at the the big furniture fair that takes place in New York every year. And this was a, a company that was super small startup. They're based in Canada. And I said, what are those? It was like, <laughs> where is the shiny glowing object? <laughs> and um, the first product that I had seen of theirs are these uh, triangular tiles. So they're these triangles and they, they glow led light. So it's not, it's not good as a lamp. It's not a lamp that with task light that can throw mm -hmm. light, but it's great for accent light or it's mm -hmm. great to have a glow in one, one side of the room and the so like mood lighting for mood lighting. Yeah. And it does, I mean, they're quite, bright and they um they have this really perfect milky dispersed light i've 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 obviously geeked out about these and and have looked into and i know that they have leds that are coming in from the side so it's not points of light sometimes when you have leds there are points of light this is this just beautiful milky surface and i think the core set comes with nine so what you can do and the, the original ones were triangles and so what you can do is you can tile the triangles together and make um, patterns with them. And then you put them with double stick take on, on the wall and they are um, full spectrum LEDs. And there's an app that comes with them. And there are these little cards that are also just kind of wonderfully elegant objects in themselves that, that um, connect one panel to the other like there are these slots so you can always take them apart and rearrange them and you can have them sort of snaking over a doorway or you can have them spread across um a wall i think they also sell these l-shaped brackets so that you could have one kind that kind of um, snakes around a corner um, but I have, uh, used them in my home before I've used them in my office. I originally used them, uh, at, well, I just use them to pr and you program them with an app and you can program actually animation. So you can program it so that there's, they go from blue to red, let's say, and they, or they flash red or, and so th they're actually a thing that I've been really interested in for a lot of different reasons. First, just personally, you know, for my home. And then for a lot of the work that I do, I mean, my specialty is really around designing physical products that have some kind of interactivity. And I am really um, particularly passionate about the way objects express themselves without 
having to rely on a screen. So we do that through light, sound, and movement. So the ability to program these to say like, well, what's it like if it's flashing red? And I can, you know, when somebody walks in the room, I can let them know that there's, this is some kind of alert, or if it's just kind of a, a cool pulsing of blue and you can adjust the timing, you can adjust the intensity of the light, you can adjust the color temperature of the light. And, um, the, but you know, one of the first things I did was I had it in a room that was doubling as my studio and my son's, um, bedroom <laughs> when I, when I, I had the studio mm-hmm. and then I had a child and then I didn't really have that studio so much anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, uh, but we, you know, when he was sleeping in there, I used it a little bit for sleep training because the room didn't get great natural light. And I was trying to train him to, you know, at 7 a.m. we wake up and, and, oh, and this is the time we go to sleep. And so what I did is I actually programmed the lights so that they had this kind of sunrise effect at cool. 7 a.m. Yeah. And then I would go in the room and we would both point to the light. So even before it went, you know, before he was even one or, or really speaking, we would both point to the light and we would know, you know, he'd go, mama, mama, time to wake up. And so I love that we had this nonverbal communication between me, my son and the object. So the, my, my question in, in, is that, so these are kind of hexagonal shaped ones and they um, about the size of, I don't know, maybe a, a book. Right. Probably. Or pot holder. I'm looking, pot I mean, holder. I'm looking at and, a pot holder. And right the now. idea is, is that you can, you can just uh, connect them together just by sliding them into each other on any of the six sides that they have. Is that mm-hmm. right? And then, um, so and any one of these would be able to produce kind of like almost any color. Yes. All right. And so, um, and then you see they're, they're programmable. So, so where are you programming them from? Is there an app that they have to be plugged into or is there a driver that um, a box that's driving all these? And is there some limit to the number of uh, hexagons that you can add to it and, do you, when you are programming, do you have to kind of indicate where it is or are they smart enough to know um, that the hexagon 13 is connected to hexagon 12 mm-hmm. and 15? Mm-hmm. Excellent questions, Kevin. So they, um, they're programmable through an app. The, there's a Nanoleaf app. And the, the ones that I've had for a long time were, were actually the triangular shaped ones, which are about the same scale, about the size of a, of, of a pot holder. The hexagons are their, their newest, uh, brand new product that has just, um, emerged. But, uh, for, so for the triangles, you know, you program them, you connect them together and they're smart enough to know what configuration they're in. So when you go in the app, you just have to, sp- um, spin it so that, and it doesn't know, what direction the first one is in, but it knows from that first one that it's connected, let's say on the um, right side of the triangle or the left side of the triangle and so forth along the chain of triangles. Um, So that that's, it's, it's kind of a really satisfying thing because you connect them together and it all connects through um, your Wi-Fi network. So in the app, you put in a code that connects to the base. It Everything connects to a base. So the base knows, I guess that's really what the core of how it's orienting itself. Like the, the base is the first connection and then everything connects along one of the sides of the shapes. Um, so the more recent thing I've been using and been hoping to get more sophisticated with the programming. Like I'd love to connect it to my calendar so that my students know when I'm busy or when I'm not busy or when I'm in the office or not. Um, and I'm also working on working with a composer and hoping to build these into a music sequencer for an exhibition that the 4D design program's doing um, was planned for Design Week in New York, which is in a few weeks, which will uh, hopefully be rescheduled sometime in October. And there is an there is an API for doing more advanced programming with the 
the panels and the hexagonal panels have the ability to do capacitive sensing. So whereas the triangular ones that I had, which were the original, the original product in the original kit were um, simply outputs, they were lights and you program the, the pattern of the lights, the hex ones, and there are also square tiles um, understand a touch and they actually understand um, they have multiple sensors in a panel. And so it understands if you swipe from the top of a panel to the bottom, I believe. So I haven't, so I just got my hex panels and have just started to play with the development kit and the, the API for programmers to get into the nitty gritty. And I'm pretty psyched about that. Oh, great. Okay. So that's, um, it's a really great uh, thing to experiment with. It's almost kind of almost like an art tool. Um, mm -hmm. And so you have a, you have another um, arty kind of uh, tool to suggest to us, the uh, trivet, I think. Yeah. So this one, you know, I was, I, I, I loved, uh, I love the premise of your podcast. And I, at first I thought, Oh, what, oh, what? And I had a few things. And then I was sitting at my table and then I just looked and I thought, this is a phenomenally cool tool in the, the vein of the cool tools. So it's the tic-tac-toe trivet and it's um, sold at the MoMA store, Museum of Modern Art. And what it is, is a, it's a series of silicone trivets that are in these bright colors. And, and a trivet is for... So... A, a, what's a trivet? Yeah. So a trivet is one of those things that you use on um, a counter or a dining room table to place a hot pot or a hot plate. Um, and so it's typically something that it, you know, it's, it's an interesting design challenge because it could be almost any shape. It just has to suspend the pot so that it has to be something that won't conduct the heat and can suspend the pot above the surface so that you protect the surface. Right. I use mine in a, a like an instant pot kind of thing so that I don't burn like if I'm cooking chicken or fish in there. Right. So this one is a trivet, and it's in the shape of a tic-tac-toe um, design, a cross hatch, you know, two lines down, two lines across, and then mm -hmm. there are X's and zeros that mm -hmm. you can move around. Yes. So all the X's and zeros are separate pieces, and then the, the board is one piece with the two lines. Mm -hmm the two lines are horizontal and two lines vertical. So from a practical point of view, it's uh, quite useful because there are a lot of different shapes. So they're the little, like the, the X's and the O's are really small. So they're good for a small pot or plate. And then the board is quite large. So that's good for a larger one, or you can kind of distribute them. So you could take three of the O's or you could take a couple of the X's. And so if you had a really long dish that was hot or something that was irregularly shaped, you could accommodate that. Um, but then what I also love about this is that it, when you don't have anything going on, I just, I leave it on my table all the time because it's just something fun and playful and it's a conversation piece. And, and they're, they're, you know, this, this sort of um, silky velvety silicone. So they're, they're quite nice to touch. And, um, you know, I used to work as a designer for the firm smart design. And we had this term that we use, it was called fiddle factor. If any, folks have the OXO good grips mm -hmm. tools. They have those yeah, ribs on those. them. And, yeah. And the ribbing is kind of like, yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, practical function to it, but it's also kind of a fiddle factor. Like you just kind of rub your hands along. I those love ridges. that term. <laughs> yeah. I'm all about the fiddle factor. The fiddle factor, right? It's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it serves a purpose. It seems, seems useless, but it serves mm -hmm. a purpose. So these have kind of 
fiddle factor on the tabletop. And um, I also just have a really personal connection with this because this was designed by a woman named Alexa Forney while she was a student at the School of Visual Arts Products of Design program, where I also was a a founding faculty member and and used to teach. So I have big love for that program. And they did a, a project with MoMA where the students actually came up with designs and then MoMA produced them and distributed them and they get, and the students get a royalty. And so I I just love every aspect of that project, but I adore Alexa. And this was of all the students, she was the one I was closest with. Um, I knew her when she was a student at Drexel university and she was an intern slash apprentice in my studio when I was working on the Leo, the maker Prince book. So we worked very, I worked her quite, hard I think she would say so um so it's great to see I'm just happy to see this product out in the world and you know there's something that's a byproduct of her creativity and imagination so it it's it makes me happy on many levels very nice and that's important with tools as well as anything else in our lives is that spark of joy yes definitely yeah. Yeah. So you so, have a fourth uh, tool for us. Um, I do. So tell us about um, this one. Okay. So this one is the, um, you know, and I don't know, it has a name. I purchased it. I don't, I don't know. I think the name has significance. Uh, it's called the mod M O D visual countdown, mm-hmm. 60 minute timer. And I'll describe it. So it's, um, desktop little timer and it um has a clock face that goes from zero to 59 and uh, i think it's in five minute increments increments Mm -hmm. and you dial in the time you want let's say you know i want i want to time out 20 minutes so you dial in 20 minutes and then as you put it in this um uh arc of red fills the face of the timer to the to the wedge that you know to the pie pie piece uh, corresponding to how much time you said so if you set it for 30 minutes half of it would be this red ring and the rest of it would be white and that red ring is happening mechanically it's actually mm-hmm. a, a layer that's underneath okay. the first layer so i love the simplicity of it it's not like you dial it and then there's a series of leds that fills it, it up it's actually physically um revealing this um ring that is underneath the white face and then it counts down it does so electronically and then it and then it beeps when it when it's done and it's got a, a, it's also got a silicone um, outer coating. It's got this outer cover. And so um, I've been use, using it a lot with my son. And, th- you know, this is, I mean, we're recording this in the midst of the pandemic when everybody is working from home and socially isolated. And I have been, um, you know, working alongside my four-year-old and uh, I'm learning the art of, of negotiating with a four-year-old. <laughs> I mean, I knew it before, but now like the game has been upped and, um, and I actually really uh, am up to the challenge because I believe wholeheartedly in children working alongside their parents and, and learning what their parents are doing and learning about the world through that work. So I, so I, 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 I quite like some parts of, of this challenge. And so the timer is a core part of the negotiation process I find. (laughs) So, you know, there are things kind of like, oh, you know, okay, you can watch 20 more minutes of this, this cartoon and then it's bedtime. And so the timer, it's, it's a little bit like what I was describing with the the wake up lights, but it is a way for the, the two of us, you know, it's not, it's not, it's, it takes the pressure off of me. It's not, it's not me saying that time is up. It is the object that's saying that time is, and we have both agreed to follow what the object says. Abide by the object. Yeah. Abide by the object. (laughs) Right. uh, The, uh, that that little like Pac-Man-ish wedge is so Mm. appealing and and such a visual 
like representation. I, I think that people who are like into the Pomodoro technique and stuff would right. find that useful. Right. right. The, the advantage that it has over my standard alarm these days, which is to ask Alexa, um, is that you get to see the the passage mm-hmm. at a glance. You can actually, you're not just hearing the alarm, yeah. but you're seeing all the stages in between. So you you have an interface for the passage of that time. Right. You know how much yes. less. You know, every time it's I make exactly. tea, I set the timer, my set my like Alexa timer for five minutes. And then uh, every time without fail, when the timer goes off, I'm like, what the hell is that? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So this is also, you know, the fact that it's portable, you could place it right in the content, like you could place it on your kitchen counter. So if you're like, oh, yeah, yeah that's the timer. Right. The, then the red wedge does this thing where you can actually see it in your peripheral vision. So if you were doing Pomodoro technique, for example, you would be able to see it, but it wouldn't have to be you know, right in front of you. Right. That's right. so cool. Yeah. That's a really, That's nice. really wonderful. And yeah. so that goes for, uh, what is it looking? Um, 20, $27. It was like on Amazon. And um, you say, is it mechanical or is it electronic? I was a little confused by that. It's electronic. Okay. So it has battery in it. It has a battery in it. Yeah. Yeah. It has a double A, I think one, I don't know if it's one or two double A's, but it has a battery in it and it will beep when it's done and it moves and the movement I believe is motorized. Okay. Um, and if for some reason that brilliant red was not to your liking, I guess they have a blue version. I don't know why you'd want blue, but. <laughs> well, you know, to yeah. each his own. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, cool. I love that. Yeah, really great. That's a good gift item also. Yeah. 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 So, okay, so we have a, a few minutes, and uh, let's talk about uh, what is the 4D design program that you're running at Cran- Cranbrook? Yeah. So for those folks who may not be familiar, and Cranbrook's a very small institution, um, Cranbrook Academy of Art is a s- small graduate um art academy that is for uh, master students studying only art design and architecture. And it's very small. They're about 150 students. And uh, Charles and Ray Eames were here. Ilya Saarinen was part of the core faculty designing the original program. So it's a place with with a rich history in design and also also craft. Um, there's a metal smithing department as well as a fiber department, a ceramics department and and several others. And where's um, it based? It's based in suburban Detroit in a town called Bloomfield Hills on a really beautiful 300 acre um, campus. And um, I was invited uh, as one of the candidates to present a vision for the program. And what I thought that, you know, and and it was really a vessel, this name 4D design. And everyone asked me, what the heck is 4D design? And the vision that I put forth that the school decided to go with is around what I would call tangible interaction or how we interact with everything in our physical world, be it objects or environments. And so it really is a a way of thinking about one, one way that I think about it is, is smart objects. I've created a series of courses in my past around designing smart objects. So we make things smart either through embedded electronics. So we might have mm-hmm. an electronics or robotics inside of a, t- a table that allows the table to walk across the room or make a sound. Uh, or we are on the other end of the spectrum. We're also building a lab that does what I call mixed reality, where we're making an object smart through the use of cameras and projected imagery so that we might project onto an object and then have that projection react to a, um, what a person does. So we're, we're looking at everything from um, robotics to home appliances to uh, we have a student who works on large scale art, art sculptures, light sculptures, um, all kinds of experiences with interacting 
with our physical world. And again, a, a lot of that's part of our palette is light, sound, and motion. And all of our students are using, I don't know how geeky our listeners are, but we're using microcontroller platforms such as Arduino and the Raspberry Pi. And so everyone is soldering electronics. So we have a few of these quad hands in our studio and everyone is adept with um, using electronics and some basic coding skills. Man, that sounds so cool. Yeah, yeah. And so are these, are, this is a master's program. Yes, it's an MFA. It's a Master of Fine Arts. And we we are welcoming, so we put together a studio. And another thing that's quite unique about Cranbrook is we don't have traditional class structures. So we bring in a lot of visiting artists to do workshops and what we call charrettes or kind of like, you know, three or four day intensive projects. And then most of the time is spent in a studio environment where there is peer learning as well as guidance from me as the the leader of the program. And so uh, we, as the leader, I try to build a cohort that's mixed with um, technologists and engineers, as well as artists and designers, and they all share knowledge with one another and they work on projects and the main learning happens through those projects and through critique. Do you have like a summer program for those who don't have a full two years? Not yet. We don't, not yet, mm -hmm. but. It's, you know, could be in the works. <laughs> okay. And, and, and these days, uh, I guess you have to work remotely. So what's that like? Uh, um, it's pretty challenging because the program is so physical. focused. It's yeah. so physical and so hands-on. But we are making it work. Um, students have dispersed and are in uh, all corners of the planet. We have a fellow who's in Australia. Um, we have a fellow who's here in Detroit. We have uh, we have a couple of students um, from China who uh, are here, but maybe getting back there. So it's it's been you know, we've had to adjust schedules. We've had to and and what we've been doing lately is everyone's working in their own spaces, and we do critique via video. So. Um, you know, everyone takes a video of their project ahead of time. So uh, the silver lining there is that when you work in art and design, it's really important to be able to do what we call documenting your work or, you know, really know how to take a great picture of it or do a really communicative video. So the students are getting practice at doing that, but it's quite challenging and we're really sorely missing the, the, uh, the community vibe of of sharing tools with one another yeah you know, bad. Wow. um tell us a little bit about the the book that you wrote uh it's been out uh, a couple of years um yeah and i love that the illustrations were actually like photos of 3d prints that you designed and yeah yeah this was the first project that i did when i when i broke off i was working for a firm for many years and then and then decided to start my own practice and i thought oh here are all these really practical projects i could do and i want to do the the most outlandish one which i said i want to do this project i mean it started out as a research project and i was interviewing folks so it was around i started research around 2013 2012 and i um had interviewed experts because I realized that the advent of desktop 3D printing, not 3D printers, because I knew they were around and I had been using them as a professional for some time, but desktop 3D printers that would be in people's homes and in libraries and such were going to be really revolutionary. So I was trying to figure out what the possible futures were for that and decided to, instead of doing a paper or some kind of serious project, to put it in a children's book. And so the children's book uses a main character that is a robot that beats a woman named Carla and she's never seen any kind of robot like that before. And so the story unfolds through their friendship and through the friendship, it, the she's able to describe the anatomy of the robot and in doing so describe how 3d printing works so the robot has a heated nozzle for a tail and he wears a spool of plastic on his back and he carries around a tray and um yeah the core premise of the book is that a lot of the um, illustrations are objects that are woven into the narrative like there's a little boy who lives on the beach in coney island and he's got a slipper and the slipper is actually actually a 
3D printed object that is photographed and featured in the book. And at the end of the story, there is a URL to Thingiverse and um, anyone can download and 3D print any of the objects of the book. So the characters are part of those objects. And then there are lots of other, ob- there's a, a character that's a jewelry designer. So there's jewelry that can be printed. There's the shoe. There are these toy musical instruments, um, et cetera. So it's been a really, really satisfying project, probably my most satisfying project, because I I really got to see how it traveled around the world and touched people. And, um, you know, my favorite story was an email I got from a library in Scotland that said, we're the first library in the UK to have a 3D printer. And we've been doing a regular program with visually impaired kids for years. And this book was an extra special experience for them because they were actually able to hold in their hands part of the story while we were telling the story. That's so cool. Yeah. Because they would like 3D print out the the characters and and things. Right. Wow. That's yes. Yeah. So that kind of gave me goosebumps and made me feel like, oh, I love I love that this is just a thing, a project that can be out in the world and have a life of its own and and I can see what people have done with it. And you know, all the all the objects are just on the cloud and the, it was my chance to experiment as a designer with with this totally um uh, alternative way of physically distributing objects because as a professional designer I was I was very aware with of the the process of warehousing and shipping products across the country and all of the wastefulness of having things in trucks and I and I thought you know with 3D printers could people simply have a file that lived on the cloud and then have that object. And, and with this project that it happened almost over overnight, you know, like I launched the book and next thing I knew there's, there, there's a little sheep character that's part of the, the story or sheep object, I should say a little toy sheep. And the sheep started showing up in, you know, Japan and the Netherlands and, and uh, Italy. And, and it was, it was uh, a really great way to see the experiment be realized uh, in the world. I love that. And, yeah, it's really and great. so in the next um, minute or so that we have, tell us about your RoboPsych podcast and, and what it's about. Yeah. So uh, I co-host a podcast. It's bi-weekly. And um, it was created by a fellow named Dr. Tom Guariello, who's a PhD psychologist. And what we do every week is we have a discussion around design and the psychological impact of uh, how we interact with robots. So I like to say it's about our hopes, fears, and wildest dreams around robots, robotics, uh, AI. And so um, he comes to it again from this PhD uh psychology background and I bring this depth of knowledge around design. And so we both bring our expertise to the table and about, you know, mo- most of the time we, we try to have guests on there. So our guests have been uh, authors, various academics, other folks who design, who are entrepreneurs, who've been designing or creating robots or other AI tools. And we delve into, you know, questions of ethics or, um, questions about how how robots have been changing the way we uh, do I mean everything uh, in our lives frankly so that's that's the the podcast that sounds great Carla this has been so much fun catching up with you and learning about the tools you use and everything that you're working on what's the best place people can go to find out more about what you're working on so I I have a website and it's just carladiana.com. Mm-hmm. Diana is my last name even though it sounds like a first name. <laughs> so it's just C A R L A D I A N A the way that it sounds. Um and that's that's the core place. I I do keep up my Instagram account. So and it's just Carla it's just at Carla Diana on Instagram. Okay. Um okay, yeah. great. Simple enough. Well, thank you. That sounds great. Wish you best of luck as um we move into a place where we can kind of regather in the physical space. I think that's so essential for doing art on the long it term. Is. And, it um, is. Uh, I congratulate you on your creativity and making that work now. And thank you for these great tools that you suggested. Oh, it's my pleasure. It was a, a lot of fun to be part of the show. Thank you. 
Hey everybody, it's Mark from the Cool Tools Podcast. I want to thank you for being a listener to Cool Tools. And I also would like to let you know about our Patreon page. If you would like to support the Cool Tools show, as well as our video channel, the website, and all the newsletters that we do, you can go to patreon.com slash cool tools. That's just one word, cool tools, and pledge any amount you want. You could even pledge a dollar a month. Every little bit helps. We have editors, we pay for transcribing costs, we pay our reviewers. Every bit of money that you contribute goes towards supporting the show. I'd like to give a shout out to our supporters of the Cool Tools podcast. This week, I'd like to thank the following Patreon supporters. Bill Schuler, Bob Kay, Ryan Pelly, Carl D. Patterson, Chad Cosby, Chris Wieland, Chris Weirstook, Craig Tooker, Dan O'Brien, Dean Putney, Donnell Cunningham, Evan Barker, Graham Medlin, Hans Riesbeck, Helen Hegedus, Jerry Kearns, Jim Lesko, Jim Spofford, John Pollock, John Burdenbaugh, Keith O, Ken Altman, Les Howard, Lauren Bast, Mock Nerd, Malton Make, Mark Goebel, Matt Gromes, Michael Douglas, Michael Jones, and Michael Pecorini. Thanks to all of you for supporting the Cool Tools Show. We really appreciate it. 